So thanks a lot for joining us today for the DCR Research Forum. We're very fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Charles Carter, who is an associate professor at Campbell University College of Pharmacy. And he both instructs the pharmacy students there as well as plays a key role in the Masters of Science of Clinical Research program there and instructing students in that program. He's had a, a very interesting career. He was just giving me some of the details of that. And he used to work at Salix Pharmaceuticals, which was in Raleigh. And uh, prior to that, ran his own company called the Pharmaceutical Strategic Initiatives. And he did consulting there, both strategic consulting and research and trial design consulting, as well as regulatory preparation for a lot of pharmaceutical companies. And then even before that, he was the director of research and clinical services at the National Pharmacotherapy Institute in Tennessee, where he oversaw a lot of phase three and phase four programs, as well as some outcomes research initiatives that they ran. And so we're very excited to, to have him today talk about frontiers of clinical research. Thanks a lot for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's actually more of an honor for me. And before I get into any substance of, of this the actual talk, I got to tell you something, something that I thought about. And first, first ground rule here is I would love to, for this to be interactive. If you have questions, raise your hand, OK? I, do, I would prefer that than even speaking for 30 minutes and then fielding questions. So if I say something that you either want to give an example of, support, or refute, please do so. Okay, that, That'll make it truly interactive. It'll be good. But when I was walking into this building, I remembered I grew up outside of Buffalo, New York. Next to Buffalo, New York, we have this landmark. It's kind of like a water feature we call Niagara Falls. <laughs> now. Niagara Falls and living by the lake, I was there for 20, I left there when I was 23. The remarkable thing is when I moved to Tennessee, from Buffalo to Tennessee, my girlfriend that was going to become my wife asked me something about Niagara Falls at night. I thought about it. I lived there for 23 years, a short drive away, and never realized in my backyard what Niagara Falls looked like at night because I never saw it. So I didn't have that realization. I didn't have that appreciation for what I really had. I'm saying this when I walked into DCRI, this building today. It made me think that I should share with you, you know, my error or my, what well, I say, lack of appreciation of what I had in my backyard. And people fly all over the world to see the Niagara Falls. They, do, they honeymoon there. It's, a, it's, what, it's a, this, one of the seven natural attractions of the world. I picked this up today. If you guys haven't taken five seconds just to appreciate where you are and the quality of research, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything you don't know. I think I'm going to learn from you, which is another reason I need this to be interactive. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and the time to be here. The title of this talk is actually Frontiers in Clinical Research. And I just want to address three topics. This is a talk that's very similar to what I gave at the ACRP meeting, the local chapter meeting here in Research Triangle Park. I think it was last September. And also was planning to give to a broader audience to uh, clinical research professionals. And it touches upon three topics. Um, the business and financial aspects, because I think it's good to know. It's a healthy perspective to have, because it helps put an understanding of some of the things that we might want to do in clinical research, gives us an understanding of why we can or cannot do them, or if we are doing them, how to do them and address these issues, because we can actually work this in our favor. The second is identify and go through what have been the reported barriers for conduction of clinical research. But in an organization such as this, quite honestly, these barriers have been identified and for the most part uh, turned into opportunities. But those, what you guys have learned and what you do here could be shared to a broader context to help out clinical research taking place in other sites of the country and the world. And finally, just to update you on some of the areas where clinical research is advancing science, 
and bringing products of value to patients that need them, whether they be uh, products for diagnosis or treatment, or long-term management. We'll go through them. So let's take the first one. I have to do this by a show of hands, all right? And there's some interesting things about my questions because they're trying to reinforce learning objectives. So this first question is, the cost of drug development may be characterized by which statement? A, there has been a steady and gradual increase since 19, the 1970s to the present day. The cost to develop B, the cost to develop one new drug just crossed a billion dollar threshold. And that includes the cost of failures as you're going through, a failed study, a failed indication. C, the cost of development is lower today than it was in the 70s and 80s. Or D, they've doubled in the last 10 years. How many people vote A? How many people vote B? C, D. Okay, we'll see the answers in a little bit, all right? It was nice, I think it was like almost 25, 25, 25 across the board. All right, let's look at this one. The time it takes for a product to go from synthesis, which is, I won't say discovery, but isolation of the compound, to approval on average for a new drug, not a generic drug, in the United States in terms of months, is it 240 and a half, 128, 61.5, or 96.8? How many people think A? I got some A's, B's, got some more B's than A's, C, some people unsure, D. I got some more D's, but I think B's take that. So we'll come back to these questions as we go through. So right now, there is a center that's at Tufts University. It's called the Center for Drug Development and Discovery. And what they do is they do these economic assessments amongst other things. So the answer to the first question is actually $2.6 billion. That is a lot of money. I haven't seen a million of anything, so I don't even know what a billion is. And I sit down, I think about it, that's a phenomenal number. But how do I interpret that? How do I put that in perspective? I don't want to take the immediate reaction and say, you know, it's too expensive just because I, it's, a, uh, it's a large number. You need to think through this. Let's take this slide here. This just came out this spring. And it actually shows the answer to my second, my first question is that the price of developing a new product has actually doubled in the last 10 years. Does anybody, can anybody give me a reason as to why it might have doubled in the last 10 years? Okay, well you're gonna know it by the time we leave here because we're gonna go into that in some of the frontiers. Now, I am not saying that the prices have gone up. I'm saying the cost of doing a study has gone up, or doing a, the development program has gone up. And this was determined by actually tracking 106 products. And taking these 106 products, of which seven are still in the pipeline, and determining the cost for the animal testing, the preclinical work, the clinical work, for all the indications that that product was going through for a potential approval. If an indication was rejected or the studies failed, those costs were included as the product went for its approved indication. So of the 106 products, I think 99 were tracked from the beginning of its development to approval. And that's how that number's come up. So with that, there's a hint. It's telling us where research is moving. And we'll come back to that. So, as you can see, the model of traditional drug development is changing. From a business model perspective, it couldn't continue the same way. Technology had to be embraced, novel thinking had to be a, a higher part of the development, and we had to get really smart about what we were doing. Because the business of drug development could not continue, and as a result of these changes, it's created some new opportunities for us. And whenever there's challenges, I'm sure all of you are solution-minded. You're thinking of a solution. All of you have seen this, and you're aware of this, so this is not something new. This still hasn't changed over the years. By the time we get through 
the, the screening of products, about 10 to 20 of these substances out of 10 to 30,000 will actually go into preclinical testing and then it scales down from there. Such that by the time we get a product to complete phase three, we got that candidate drug that's now become the approved product. It really works in this inverse funnel in terms of numbers. These have not changed. The answer to the second question, from the point of synthesis, meaning that that's the time where a product could be isolated and you know, manufactured or produced, on average, takes about 128 months. That's about 10 and a half years. The significance of that is obviously, we need to move through this and shorten this timeline if we can, because there's this little thing called patents. And patents expire. And the investment that I showed you earlier needs to be recouped in order to fuel the well-being of that organization that developed the product and provide an investment for additional research and development. It's a cycle that has to keep it has to be continual. Afterwards, then we have increased access to a lot of therapies by the, the potential approval of generics, which follow a completely different timeline. So everything I'm saying here, and what I suspect, most of the products, if not all the products you work with, are innovative products. Now, this is just for informational purposes. What is the success rate if you're going from one phase of clinical development to the next? So going, oh, sorry. From going from phase one to two is about 59%, two to three, 35, and you can see how this goes. But overall, from phase one to approval of an NDA for a drug product or a BLA for a biologic license is about 11.8%, which is really, depending upon how you look at it, may be an impressively high number to you when you look at the funnel or a low number saying we're learning as we go, but folks, that's why we do research. There's another thing about that I want to point out. Just because a product fails, you notice I've said a few times, we're including the cost of quote failures. We learn from our failures. Researchers develop better study protocols, better methodology, better ways to develop products from the lessons of a failed product than one can imagine. So if you look at cancer, just cancer alone as an example, 96 unsuccessful attempts in, with melanoma, 75 for brain cancer, and 167 for lung cancer. And you think these are like failed attempts to come up with a product to treat, but we all know these are some of the most exciting areas for development because while we've had these failures, we've also had seven new drugs for melanoma, three for brain cancer, and 10 for lung cancer. So the point is, Adding to the knowledge base is key and it's central to what I think all of us are chemistry for us as individuals. So don't ever lose that. And remember, you'll probably be involved or have been involved in trials that don't meet their, you know, their, their stated uh, outcome, but you're generating knowledge. Let's look at some of these challenges. Uh, several, not several years, a few years back, the Department of Health and Human Services, of which is over the FDA, asked for a study to be performed and to identify what are the challenges in the United States at that time for the conduction of clinical research. You can get this report by going to the Department of Health and Human Services. The report itself was put out in 2014. However, at least two publications of this report have also come out, one in 2016 and one in 2017. I have defaulted back to the report because I think it's a little bit more comprehensive than what you see in the publication. So let's talk about these for a second. We'll go into each one quickly, but I want to go through them. Let's uh, look at high financial costs. Remember I said that the cost of developing a drug product has doubled in 10 years? Herein lies part of the reason. And it's not an economic reason. It is the type of focus of our studies. So the high financial costs are in part because there's a shift from going for, from products to treat short-term or acute conditions to more chronic or degenerative conditions. So by default, these studies tend to be longer. They be, tend to be larger. 
and even subsequent to the approval of a product, the required studies thereafter, long-term safety studies are put in place. And this is a shift from what we saw like back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. If I take it one step further and give you some additional information, if you think about the U.S. population, and this is, these are U.S. numbers, and this is actually coming from a different report, 40% of the population ha does not have a chronic condition. This is any adult from 18 to the end of life. However, 31% have one to two, 16, uh, three to four, 12, five or more. If, uh, we have like 12% with five or more, but yet they consume 41% of all of our healthcare expenditures. Now, if you think about this, this is that person that may have atrial fibrillation, has um, uh, congestive heart failure as a result, hypertension, diabetes in the background. That's that type of person that has these chronic conditions. I've already said this, the timelines are longer, driving up the costs. We're trying to shorten these as much as we can without compromising the data that we generate and the conclusions that we can rely upon. Recruiting and retaining participants. I actually had a question in here, and the question um, uh, fell out for one reason or another. But do these numbers surprise you? I'm going to start at the bottom. 20% of all investigators fail to enroll a single patient. How many people are surprised by that? Nobody's surprised by that. And 30% of investigators under-enroll. And over 90% of trials are delayed because of over-ambitious timelines. And yet, at the same time, many sponsors, as this report shows, are averse to taking risks, but yet the timelines tend to be aggressive, which is kind of an interesting little dichotomy. All right? Now, each and every person in this room, as my understanding, as well as those that are watching, can impact this. Qualified personnel, investigators, and sites. Sure, there's a key shortage of personnel. That's why you have training programs the way you have. That's why you can get certifications. That's why you can get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in clinical research. You can specialize in a particular area. There is a wealth of opportunity and opportunities for employment in clinical research. You guys are, are, are part of that. Regulatory and administrative barriers. Again, these are things that you folks all know. The regulatory barriers. I remember when, I'm old enough to remember when HIPAA came into play. And boy, that changed everything. And I saw one or two people nod that they recall when that came into play. All of this de-identification of data, et cetera, and day-to-day -day practice became a real challenge for us, and we've worked our way through it. IRBs we got centralized IRBs, we got our own academic center IRBs, we got a variety of them. But in my opinion, depending upon where you are, they're either a big issue or an issue that's been addressed and now an opportunity for sponsors because of the efficiency of working with the IRB. Uh, let's go. Sponsor imposed barriers. Risk aversion. This is something that I said earlier. A lot of sponsors do not want to be the first to take on a new, te new technology, a new type of study design. This is where scientists and study design personnel can help them with this and get over the risk aversion. It's a great opportunity for sponsors to learn alongside of a research center like DCRI. Let's talk about this last one, complexity of case report forms. And I got this at the very, very bottom here, along with the fact that 60% of all studies, phase three studies, end up having amendments. When you look at this slide from 2017 as well, when you compare a typical phase three trial from 2001 to 2005 is the first column, the second column is 2011 to 2015, and the last column is the percent change in complexity. So again, this is the mean number from a, a, a set of phase three trials that were examined. The endpoints gone from seven to 13, procedures from 110 to 187, data points from approximately half a million to a million. That's pretty impressive collection of data. 
Now, does anybody have any idea what this might also be reflecting that I already talked about? Um, somebody said it. It's reflected of the fact that is this also includes the transition from longer, from shorter studies to longer, more complex studies for more chronic conditions. So data collection isn't going to get simpler, but yet with the technology and everything that we have, it facilitates it. But I will tell you, I'm really hung up on this because to me, data is king. You do not want to be alongside the FDA presenting the results of a trial and be missing data because it's just not a very fun place to be. So the, another thing that's going on is like I'm in DCRI, I'm at Duke, but there is generally a disconnect with community medicine in terms of clinical research. And not many people in like rural practice are involved in clinical research, despite the fact that there is a lack of study sites. Maybe some of these sites are not appropriate for it. But there is just a general lack of knowledge. So more in suburbia moving, moving out from urban areas, perhaps some of these sites could be recruited. Uh, barriers to academic institutions, this is just more of bureaucracy. For those academic institutions that are trying to get into clinical research but are dealing with it for the very first time. This is not necessarily relevant to sites that are experienced in doing clinical research, but yet this was identified according to this task force, as one of the top 10 barriers. Globalization. Globalization is a huge opportunity, but also has its challenges. Its opportunities as you can, you got access to patient pools. You can also decrease costs based upon costs in other countries, not necessarily matching the cost to do research in other countries. But there is ethical and scientific concerns of conducting these trials across different environments with an approval coming within a specific country. So there are limits that are put in place by different regulatory agencies of the country that is going to be accepting this data. But the change is, is obvious. If you look at this slide here, the percent of 1572s filed in 1997 were 86 percent of them were in this country. So these are FDA forms. In 2007, which is the latest data I have, it's 57% with Western Europe and the rest of the world consuming the rest. So we see this research going. And this is a country breakdown. You can refer to this later, but you can see the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, is where there's been a, a massive uptake in terms of clinical research. This publication I still like. It was done in, in 2009. It's the ethical and scientific implications of doing research globally. I'd ask all of you to take a look at this if you get, uh, get a moment because it summarizes both the scientific as well as the ethical considerations quite a bit. And it's a, a place where you can take action. Um, I had this slide in here for a previous presentation, but if you happen to notice the authors, it reinforces what I was talking about with Niagara Falls. So I'll let that be just as that. Uh, but let's give me, let me give you one example of one of the ethical considerations. So if you're looking at the differences in reported adverse events, as well as looking at the differences in adherence across countries, you can see the difference. I'm not going to get into the reasons as to why. I think we're all savvy enough to know why these percentages could vary and why the, the numbers that withdrew consent vary. The question is, is the integrity of the data and the integrity of the study performance across countries, if it's not harmonized, if it's not optimal across platforms, could we be obtaining kind of a bias in the data that's collected? Who's got questions on those two parts? Because if not, I go to the exciting part. And I get excited about this stuff, is where research is going, all right? So here we go. Discovery and development. 
This is what I teach at Campbell in my new product development class. I use this exact slide because they haven't seen what you all seen. The discovery from taking a therapeutic aim to coming up with a candidate drug and taking a candidate drug and taking it through the process for new products as a new product to entry into the marketplace. The products I'm talking about now have all gone through this discovery phase and they're in the development phase, both preclinical as well as clinical. And they're not in any order. But let me ask you first, by a show of hands, how many products do you think are in development globally right now? A, 350, B, 1500, C, 3000, or D, 7000? How many people think A? Smart. B, C, I got some B's and C's, D. So right now, globally, there are 7,000, approximately 7,000 medications in development. These 7,000 represent individual products that are not counted twice. So they're unique products. They're not like me too type products, but unique products. These are not in any specific order. I should have put them in order, but I didn't. But you see cancer at 836, autoimmune disease is 311, neurologic disorders 420, um, cardiovascular 190, Alzheimer's 77, diabetes, and rare diseases. Rare diseases being a category, which I'll go into in a second. But this is a lot of research, a lot. I don't think it's ever been this robust because I've tried to go back and look at these numbers from prior years and I cannot find it ever being this high. Where are some of the first in class medicines being developed? By first in class, I'm gonna go back and say, these are unique chemical compounds. They are innovative in their design. They're either in their own pharmacologic class, pharmacologic subclass, which parallels a chemical class or a chemistry subclass. 86% of the products for Alzheimer's, granted, remember that number was a little bit smaller, are first in class. This again is exciting. Cardiovascular, 73% of the products are first in class. Again, very impressive, and it just testifies to the fact of the robustness of this activity. And then looking at some of the novel ones that are coming, how many of you, I'm sure you're all familiar with this CAR-T therapy. It is phenomenal. I'm not talking about cost. I'm not talking about any of this stuff. I'm just going with the science here right now. This is absolutely phenomenal. Some of the therapeutic classes that are coming out for Alzheimer's, the Zika virus, cancer, migraine, Crohn's disease. Let's just think about this. What about hepatitis C? It doesn't even make this list anymore. But if we were doing this a few years ago, it would. So look for these developments. To me, I can get really, really excited about this stuff. Rare diseases. Does anybody know how many, by, by regulatory definition in this country, a rare disease is a condition that affects how many people? It has to be less than this number. How many people think 50,000? 100,000, 150, 200,000. I feel like I'm at an auction. <laughs> Sarah has raised her hand at 200,000. It's 200,000. It affects less than 200,000 people. 200,000 people is more people than showed up at my Buffalo Bills game by a factor of two, at least, maybe four. But there's 7,000 rare diseases, and treatments only account, apply to 5% of them. In 1983, the Orphan Drug Act was passed. Prior to 1983, the number of products approved for what was considered rare diseases was as many fingers as I got on both hands. It was 10. Since 1983, it's gone up to 575 with uh, 560 medications in development right now. So rare diseases as a category, and by the way, 200,000 people and 200,000 American lives seems like a lot. 
a lot. So I think this is really, really impressive. And part of why we can do this, by the way, comes here. And it, it's with the use of biomarkers, personalized medicine, targeted therapy, precision medicine, whatever you want to call it, which is in essence being able to develop a product that's targeted based upon a biomarker. What you may not know is that approximately a little bit more than 25% of all the drugs currently approved by the FDA have some mention of a biomarker or a genetic code in their label. This wasn't the case a few decades ago, or even a decade ago. And right now, 42% of all the medications in the R&D pipeline are being identified in that first phase with discovery and then subsequent testing and development as a result of biomarkers. Fantastic development. And all that that's, this does is it allows for the, right pay, for the right drug to get to the right patient at the right time, keeping it really simple, but you can follow the uh, schematic behind me. Biologics, one of my favorite areas. Biologics is, is a develop, an area of development. Very complex, because if you think of the size of the molecular structure of a biologic, as well as the fact of the source of biologics. Right now, there is 907 biologics in the R&D pipeline. And I'm going to like stop right around here because I want to have more questions and discussion. But let me summarize some of these things. Drug development always has been, still is. It's costly, risky, and lengthy. But the rewards are worth it. The potential payoffs for a substantial improvement in the development process is it's there. It's real. We can address them, many of which have already been addressed. And while I did not show you like what happened in the 80s and 70s, 80s, and early part of 90s in terms of drug development, drug development now has accelerated. A lot of it based upon the technology and the tools that we have and the shift from acute conditions to chronic conditions, which became a very fertile um, area for, for clinical research and inquisitive minds. And I conclude with that the future of clinical research, the way I see it, has never been as exciting as it is right now. Um, at the same time, it's challenging. Nobody said our job or your job is easy. You wake up in the morning, you got to come in, and you got to start thinking. And always remember, no matter where you are in this thing, there is a patient at the other end, or a patient that may not even be born yet. So that's 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 my final words on that area. Questions, thoughts? Wonderful summary. Um, and I think there'll probably be a lot of good questions here. I, I, I'll just say general to start us off. You began with Niagara Falls and talking about um, you know, how you can live close to something and not often take all the advantages of it. What about the idea, Campbell, college and, and your pharmacy uh, trainees are just a bit down the road. How can mm -hmm. we better work with your institution? So a little background on Campbell University. So Campbell University is a, a growing institution. There's no doubt about it. So as of today, if you were to go to Bowie's Creek, you'd see that we have an osteopathic medicine school, a college of pharmacy and health sciences, which includes a nursing program, PT, pharmacy, PA, I'm going to leave somebody out and get in trouble. Um, and obviously, pharmaceutical science and the department I work in, which is the Department of Clinical Research. So we have a bachelor's of science degree of which our students come to both Duke and DCRI. And we have a master's program, which we are actually in the process of developing some rotations for our dual students that are both a PharmD as well as having a master's with DCRI. Apart from that, looking outside this teaching realm and going into the area of collaboration with faculty and our associates, the opportunity to do some collaborative research with the various databases that could be shared or using some bright minds to complement some of the things that you're doing in terms of long-term safety or data mining would be a great opportunity for collaboration. I'm open to any ideas, Dr. Peterson, anything you got. That's right off the top of my head. We have been expanding our department um, 
we, we are very proud of the fact of, of our students, some of which are sitting in the row with you. <laughs> Any other questions? So you talked about how long the process is. You mentioned how long the process is and, and that the need to accelerate that process. In, in all the consulting and, and companies that you've worked with over the years, what are some of the creative ways that you guys have come up to handle that? I don't know if this is necessarily creative, but let me rephrase the question a little bit. When an organization, a sponsor or a pharmaceutical company is developing products, they usually, in fact, I can't think of a single instance where they're just said, let's take this molecular structure and let's move this one through. They have several of them, they narrow it down in the funnel, and then they, they make decisions. The reality of it, though, is the complexity of doing clinical research often means that we have to select amongst the products we want to move forward. I'll give you a good example. We have to, uh, and I'll back up, we have to select as a result of some of those challenges. So there is a time where I was working with an ultra low molecular weight heparin. This is a compound that's smaller than a low molecular weight heparin, as you can tell, but also from the same company that had a low molecular weight heparin. The challenge that we had is while early phase one and phase two research looked favorable upon the product, we couldn't get the product, we couldn't get sites to do it. So it's not so much a creative way, we had to prioritize. We still need that creativity because what's happening, the creative, the creative minds are developing new first-in-class products faster than we can conduct that research. And everything that we're doing with research at a sponsor level and what you guys should be able to help out and actually lead the sponsors, in my opinion, is advances in technology and trial design. Trial design cannot be, it's not stagnant anymore. So uh, I teach, like I said earlier, new product development. I don't like the students to have a textbook because there's not a textbook I can give them that will be relevant in two, three, four years with the speed of trial designs and adaptive trials, et cetera, and various endpoints. The other thing that I think is creative is that the idea that the FDA is like your evaluator or your professor who grades your last paper rather than a partner in the development, that has to change and I think it has changed. And I don't think everybody appreciates that. You know, um, one of the products that I worked on was an oral botanical product. The reality of it is the FDA never approved one. So how do you develop a phase three program around an oral botanical when the FDA has never approved one? They had a dermal one. So this took a lot of negotiation sitting down with the FDA. Another one is, um, again, working with regulatory authorities, working with experts. How do you develop a trial for longer term safety initiatives, knowing that that's going to be asked? So let's get it started, you know, even prior to approval, and have it on the, on the plans, even if it's post approval. Um, I will go back to another and yet a third one. I mentioned that failures help with the research project by continuing to the knowledge base. I don't think anybody would contend that. I think another big area to shorten this is this sharing of data that once it's de-identified, call it whatever you want, but the sharing of clinical trial data and the learnings there in my opinion, are largely untapped. I mean, the potential's there to do great things, but it takes courage to share the data from one organization's trial with another organization's trial and see what we can learn. And that's actually gaining a lot of momentum, in my opinion. I know there's some initiatives going on here about big data and data sharing. I've seen some pretty crazy things, some pretty interesting things like um, study site selection. Follow the Twitter, the, the Twitter highway. So 
I had this demonstrated to me uh, one time where you can actually look at a screen and put in a topic, a therapeutic topic, and see where it's being mentioned and where that tweet is originating. And potentially, could that help us zero in as to where patients are? Because why would you be talking about it on, a, on, a, on Twitter if it wasn't really there? It wasn't affecting somebody. It may be more, more likely, though, just validate the sites we already go to. But yet, again, we're searching for, for, for patient pools. Now, going back to that ultra-low molecular heparin, when we figured out what was going on, we had over 50 competing trials. So then the company had to sit back. It's like, do we continue the trial with the low molecular heparin that we have? Or do we take those sites and let's slow down that trial to institute a new trial? And that's where you just got to make those decisions, which is the best thing to do for a therapeutic advance, a business you know, viability. They're complex decisions. Electronic medical records, I mean, we all know that all this, as much as we can get away from paper, speeds up everything. Other thoughts, other questions? Yeah. Really nice talk. I think it put together in a concise manner some of the concepts we throw around as clinicians, but the, these figures and the, the tables you presented were really nice. Um, I think we spent a good bit of time exploring this development process, but I'm also struck as a heart failure doc now that we have a couple of these new therapies that have substantial benefits for mortality and reductions in heart failure hospitalization, but no one is using them, or the use is so low. So I'd be interested from your perspective and kind of expertise in this space, are there things we should be doing during the development process to think ahead about the implementation piece? That is a, a, a great question. And it's a complex question. So part of the implementation, I think what you're talking about is access and you know, approvability. Are these products going to be paid for? Are these products going to be covered? Am I correct on that? So the big push right now, on, I'll say on the sponsor side of things, is to make sure that you can demonstrate value. Now, I don't mean value in the sense of like, oh, that's a good value, and like anecdotally, but value as a mathematical equation of benefit, the, the incremental benefit over the incremental cost. Sometimes we can't get the value we want. Other times we can. You can think of not just heart failure, getting these products covered, which could actually, you know, um, shorten hospital stay, decrease morbidity, uh, morbidity and mortality. How do you get them covered? The way our system works in the United States is we got to work with our plans, our um, PBMs. There's one thing that companies are actually doing too. Uh, all of you have heard of budget impact models, right? There's a budget impact model is where you take your comparative products and you put the new product in, you put in the, the data as it relates to its efficacy, safety consequences, and everything that's associated with cost. And it says, OK, if I was to adopt this, this is the impact of my budget. The problem with budget impact models, historically, has been they've been developed by sponsors. Well, one of the things that I think has been a, an improvement is this component called FADAMA 114. FADAMA 114 requires that if I was the sponsor, I can't just walk in and say, here, this is why our product is great. And this is why our product is value. Because guess what? I got a bias, you know? Because if I didn't have a value, I probably wouldn't bring it to you. But everybody else has it too. FADAMA 114 requires that such a model, if it was to be developed and presented as like a tool for promoting value, needs to be either developed or validated by an independent authority, OK? Not connected with the sponsor at all to make sure it is it is real. I would like to see us do more of that that way and then do decision analytics and apply it to a population that is most relevant to the geography that we're talking about. Now, if you want to go nationally, you can. But if you want to go you know, smaller and smaller and smaller. In addition to that, being able to track outcomes, not just based upon a prospective model on historic data, but to be able to track the outcomes and compare real time 
using the data sets that you can get from the provider and the payer and the affiliates of the payer could easily, and not, I shouldn't say easily, could be put in place to track. But that, that really takes the, takes the science, and I mean you have to put the science in terms of application for access to care. So there's no easy answer, but I will tell you this, keep, um, keep uh, these products when they keep coming and having value along those lines that we see them as healthcare professionals, we just seriously got to start shaping our policy. I mean, I don't want to get in a political discussion with you, but I'll tell you, I, this is some interesting products up here, right? And I covered a lot of them, but I bet you the majority of them are going to have a tough road to hoe in terms of getting used in the marketplace because of perhaps less, of, less costly and probably less effective medications being the mainstay. And that's the bar that we have to move. So look, health outcomes, I, th I think that's the fertile area for clinical research. I really do. I do believe health outcomes is truly a clinical research component. I know some people like to separate it out, but the two go hand in hand. If they're not in the, con they're in the continuum. So the more that we can do, the better. And there is a lot more sharing of, we've all heard about big data. There's a lot more sharing about that these days, and that's where the future resides. It's another opportunity to the first question that Dr. Peterson asked for a potential for collaboration, too. And that, that uh, academic centers working, working together across the board would be extremely valuable in this area. Other questions? Was that a good answer to your question? Do you have any other way? I mean, I wish I knew a better way. Uh, you know, I think the challenge is that if you go through the development piece, the, the end is on just getting it to the market. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, the idea of probably appropriately getting people involved earlier that have the bigger picture in view. Now, I will, I will say this, as products do come to market, and I've seen this firsthand. And um, every product, every year, as it's going through development, will have an, a, an assessment performed at least once. Because if you have to think of the financing associated with, um, with a, a pharmaceutical company, of being able to project its utilization and its eventual sales. That's just part of doing good business. Assumptions are made about access and availability of a product in, in this. And so these targeted product profiles are created. We call them TPPs in, in the industry. And quite often, the example I gave about the ultra low mode heparin, the decision was, let's hold this one. This is a no-go right now. It's simply because we couldn't get the studies done, couldn't get them completed in time with patent life to recoup it. But at the same time, when these are being made today, the actions to, to um, go into agreements to allow access with plans and PBMs are being contemplated and thought of. However, there's some restrictions to talking about a product prior to its availability because you're not only off-label, there is no label. So that negotiation really can't start as quickly as one would want it to be. On top of it, the negotiations to put something on formulary, most of them will have the six month waiting period. And quite often, it's a year. And when you start thinking about the updates to formularies, you could be two years out of a product being available and still not being utilized the way, as investigators, you saw patients respond to, to the product in clinical trials. So I'd love to see that accelerate. And the only way I can uh, say that is also better understanding the burden of disease and the potential for impact as well. I like that question. I have one more question. Um, you've, worked, you've obviously worked with a lot of companies over time in, in drug development, child design, uh, been by the side of a lot of companies when you're at the FDA. And you mentioned the 
exploding number of data points that are collected in, in trials and, and the lengthening of CRFs. Um, in your experience, how many of those data points end up being useful to the company and who's driving that explosion in the data points? Is it regulatory? Is it the companies themselves? Is it the researchers? I, I think it's a combination of all of them. In fact, I'll add a few other components. When the explosion of data points, a large part of it is because it, we've gone to electronic case report forms. So just the timing of the completion electronically, you can get a lot more done than when you're doing pen to paper. So when we do an electronic, I remember sitting in meetings and saying, well, let's get this. Well, what would we use that for? Well, if we ever wanted to see if it had an effect on down the road on this, a, a safety concern. There were also some data points that were collected simply to see if there were changes in different laboratory markers for the recommendation in terms of what testing should be performed if you are on the therapy. So we had a protocol, but we're collecting so much information above and beyond it, which you'd get when you would have to write it down and then have the validation of it, search for missing, the queries, all that kind of stuff. The electronic record has made it so much easier. The data points on that slide, though, you also have to keep in mind, were reflective of the time period elements of the type of study being performed. So in the first column, when we're going back 2001, 2005, I believe it was, was one set of phase three trials. The second set was also incorporating the fact that we have more chronic conditions, more chronic disease, and longer trials, which increased that number as well. But I can tell you that, so there's two, two forces at hand that are increasing the number of data points. The trial itself being a chronic therapy and a longer study and more focused on safety. And then the other one, the conversion from paper to electronic. And we could collect more data in the same amount of time by removing the human element of writing it down. And so those were, those were collected. I remember it used to be, man, let's collect as little as we can because it will save money. But when you look at the back end, having to have to do another study because you didn't get something that you had the opportunity to decide to do when you're designing a trial comes back and hurts you. And so I think the focus, once again, on patient safety, do no harm, is really driving uh, the other components. So those two components, type of study, length of study, and the whole safety concern is what's driving that number. Just push back a little bit. Um, I think most of the data points are still requiring some level of input. Oh, there yeah. aren't that many that are you know, automated from the EHR or laboratory. Right. So I would say it still costs more to collect more. And at a recent meeting, um, talking about one of the, I think, DCRI registries, I'm having a horrible time trying to find the right distance for this, you know, out of 300 or so variables in a registry, all the publications used 50 or so. So I think, I, I don't think it's a free lunch, and I don't know no, that going electronic free. necessarily takes less time. And on the clinical side, it takes far more time to use an electronic health record than it ever used to use paper records. You know, 30 clicks versus an illegible signature um, is a big difference. So, so I think that's still a consideration. and and you know, there still should be thought into, you know, don't grab it all because you can or you think right. you might need it. Sometimes having, I agree with your points, especially on the clinical side. The clicks to get to where you're looking for information, definitely, definitely agree with you on that. And I will say, having too much data at times means, did you analyze the data, but I, I, I have seen the trend where we collect more. The, the thing is collect more. Whether it's less expensive, you know, you get to a point where you're collecting more, it ends up being more expensive. So I agree with that, too. Good points. Great. Well, um, thanks a lot, Dr. Thank Carter. You. It was a fantastic talk. We really appreciate you coming and spending time with us today. Thank you. I enjoyed it.